Right, good afternoon everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming to this uh, session which we've entitled Leading in Times of Crisis. Uh, my name is Mark Coziol, I happen to be the chairman of the PDA, but uh, there is also an organisation in Europe which has about six or seven or eight PDA type organisations in membership and it's called EFU, the European Pharmacists Association of uh, Employed Pharmacists. Lots of different countries involved in that and uh, every three years they change the Secretary General, so I got the Secretary General job in October of last year. Three months later the war in Ukraine started, so nobody was expecting that. But nevertheless, it's an organisation that connects the kind of pharmacist employee issues that we have here in the UK with other countries across the continent. We learn a lot of things from them, they learn a lot of things from us. It's a very, very powerful group and organisation to be involved in. We've got members in Ukraine. EFU is a regional organisation, it is a European organisation. Some of our members from Ukraine contacted EFU and said, what can you guys do to help? Because we're being destroyed. Pharmacies are being blown up, hospitals are being destroyed, wholesaling infrastructure, the roads, the railways, all being destroyed by uh, the road that we have, uh, the war that we have with Russia. Now, I want to point out at this stage something really important because I'm going to describe how we developed a scheme for medicines for Ukraine. But what I think is really exciting about what we have achieved here is the structures that we've put in place, we believe, could be used any place in the world, in any country, to respond to any kind of crisis, whether it is a natural uh, disaster, a flood or an earthquake, where, whether it is an environmental situation or whether it is a war. So the framework that we've put into place, almost by accident, we want to develop to be able to use uh, in other places in the world. So they asked us to help, but what did we decide to do? Well, we had to do a, a big situational awareness exercise to find out what was actually happening. A lot of this we've actually seen on the news. Infrastructure being destroyed, um, hundreds of hospitals literally no longer in existence. There's a, a, somebody who used to be a surgeon in an operating theatre. There's a big increase in hospital patients now. And these are patients that are um, having been damaged by blast injuries, explosions, that kind of thing. This kind of disaster is a disaster that could, happens to be in Ukraine, but it could be anywhere in the world where there is a, a war or a conflict situation. What was the next thing? There was a massive outpouring of public support. And you probably remember two days after this crisis started, the Disasters Emergency Committee created an advertisement that was on television. It lasted about two minutes. And there were record levels of funds that were being contributed by members of the public. Record breaking levels of funds sent to the Disasters Emergency Committee. The other thing that happened, and this is where we start to identify the problem, is that many members of the public, and it wasn't just the UK, it was all across the world, decided to take matters in their own hands. They descend, decided to start sending boxes containing items to the Polish-Ukrainian border. These boxes contained tents, they contained baby milk, they contained trousers, they contained sandwiches, they contained medicines. When we started to research this and we were starting to talk to the Polish uh, uh, government, they said, if you're going to run a campaign, educate the public not to send any more boxes because there is a pandemic of boxes now in Poland. Please do not send any more boxes. And when we went out, to have a look do some research, this is what we were finding. Those boxes, many of them will never ever be opened. There just isn't the possibility to open them. Some of them contain sandwiches which have rotten. Some of them have got rats running around them. Bulldozers might need to be used to manage these boxes. They're being stored in tents, in warehouses, in ditches, in fields at the side of the road under tarpaulins. It's not the way for members of the public to respond to a crisis like this especially not if they're trying to send medicines. Now, in the early days, they tried to pull some of the medicines out of these boxes, but the only things that they could pull out, which they then ended up sending to field pharmacies, that's a field pharmacy in Ukraine, it used to be a theatre, but that hospital's now been destroyed, are things like dressings, bandages. They couldn't take medicines that you would take orally or that you would inject um, into uh, a field pharmacy like this. There were also lots of deliveries of medicines from unregulated sources. These would be things like lorries that would arrive at the border 
and the delivery driver would say, can somebody sign this for me, please? And the hospitals would say, well, what is it? Well, it's medicines. Well, we can't receive this. Where does it come from? Well, I picked this up in Hamburg from another consignment. Well, has it followed the cold chain process? Is it guaranteed against FMD issues? Has it been controlled at the right temperature? Nobody could answer any of these questions. So whole lorry loads of medicines that were transported to Ukraine were left in a car park under tarpaulin outside of a hospital because the clinicians in Ukraine simply couldn't receive medicines like that. We all know, as pharmacists, because that's our area of expertise, that hospitals can only use quality assured medicines. Medicines that were transported under optimum conditions with the normal cold chain processes, under FMD conditions, under a fully regulated system. And this is something that we were discovering was part of the problem of how medicines were being delivered to this crisis. So, we decided to strike some campaign objectives. Obviously, we wanted to help the casualties of the war. That was really, really important to us. So, primarily, what we're doing is a humanitarian exercise. But actually, we wanted to educate the public to certain very important principles. Firstly, stop sending money, stop sending boxes, send money instead. And send that money to pharmacy, to pharmacists, because we can use our specialist expertise in making sure that the medicines are procured properly, delivered properly, under all those conditions that we've described. While we're talking to the public about this, we're educating them about something else. We're teaching them about medicines. We're teaching them about what role pharmacists have. So it was an opportunity to educate the public about pharmacy, about medicines, but it was also a way of engaging the public and getting them to support a humanitarian crisis in a much better way than sending boxes. But how do we raise substantial funds? Because we needed to raise funds for these medicines. Well, we knew that the public was interested because that was demonstrated with the whole Disasters Emergency Committee response. We also had, in membership of EFU, several countries, part of our membership, Germany, Austria, Croatia, Poland, France, some large countries. We knew that many community pharmacies had access to lots of members of the public. There was a possibility of engaging members of the public, walking past all of those pharmacies across the continent and teaching them about all of the things that we've already described and appealing them to donate funds. We were quite fortunate because we had specialist expertise within the group. In the UK, we had now one of the largest pharmacist unions in the world, frankly. I think it's the third largest pharmacist union in the world. We've got capacity in the office. We've got designers. We've got lawyers. We've got people who can design things. Our union in Poland, well, it's not our union, it is the pharmacist union in Poland, ZZPF, as their treasurer has a pharmacist who spent 25 years in specialist procurement of hospital medicines. So we were very fortunate. Turns out, this is something I learned, and I've been a pharmacist all my career, specialist procurement isn't about ringing up the local wholesaler and saying, have you got these in stock? It's finding out which manufacturer is producing the blood products, in which country, and when they're coming off the production line, and how much will be available, and under what conditions it needs to be transported, and what are the local regulatory issues that need to be surmounted to get these medicines to the border. All of those things. These are really specialist uh, pieces of knowledge that we as professionals, as pharmacists, actually uh, have and possess. So we decided to design a campaign poster, and you might think, well, we just come up with a poster, stuck some stuff on it. No, we spent quite a few days in an office, flip chart and penning something that needed to very easily describe what it says on the tin. We needed to make sure that our posters could appeal to the man or the woman that was running for their train and just got off the bus, and their eyes fell on that image, and they knew exactly what it meant. What it means is, the structure and the order and the tidiness and the cleanliness of a pharmacy with patently a pharmacist and in this case medicines to Ukraine. It's very obvious exactly what we're trying to achieve with this image. So it positions pharmacists and pharmacy right in the heart of the message. So this was at the very core of our campaign. Then we needed to make sure that people knew that this was being organised by pharmacists and it's about pharmacist volunteers trying to get medicines to the Ukrainian hospitals. So if you're in at the next level of looking at this poster, that's the thing that you will see. It's about medicines to Ukraine and it's about pharmacists getting involved, but we need the financial support of members of the public. Then there had to be a mechanism by which they paid. So we put a QR code on there, which you simply, you know how to use a QR code. It means that members of the public can engage with this 
very easily. And then finally, all of the organisations across the continent that we've got on board so far were across the bottom because we desperately wanted to give people a feeling of confidence, authority. This is a proper structured campaign because one of the things that we discovered during doing our research is there's a lot of private individuals making an awful lot of money out of this war in Ukraine and it ain't by helping the Ukrainians. It's by getting themselves into positions where they're doing very nicely thank you by persuading people that are trying to help the Ukrainians. So we needed to make sure that the organisational infrastructure was there to give people confidence that this is a proper, formal, official uh, programme. So we designed a poster, but it was important to internationalise the campaign. So that same image is now in posters, in pharmacies, in lots of different countries, across the continent, in all of their different languages. Exactly the same system, exactly the same underpinning mechanism, and it all goes to a website. I can't get the website on here fully, but if I was able to, I would be able to tell a very simple story. Don't send boxes. Trust pharmacists to be able to understand what to do with medicines. Medicines is an extraordinarily complex uh, issue that the expertise of pharmacy is vital to make sure it works properly. Please send us money. That is simply the message. So that's how we engage with the public on all of those uh, campaign objectives. Yes, it's a humanitarian cause, but let's teach them about the boxes, let's teach them about what we do, let's teach them about how it's done and how it should be done, and let's persuade them to pay money into uh, the campaign. So that was really important. The idea was that we have all of these different countries who are in membership of EFU send money to one central location. The treasurer of the ZZPF union happens to be in Poland. It made sense to send the money there because it's the closest place to the border. Now, this is absolutely vital. We all know what happened to the Major Tom Fund and his daughter where the newspapers said, what's happened to the money? And then Major Tom's daughter was in all sorts of trouble because she couldn't explain how they'd managed the finances. So the only problem that occurred there was not that anybody took any money that they shouldn't have done. They didn't have the structure and they didn't have the governance and they didn't have the controls and the reporting mechanisms around the finance. If we as a profession in the UK and across the whole of the continent are going to be raising large sums of money in a campaign like this, the last place we want to find ourselves in is the Daily Mail, six months time, saying the pharmacists are taking the cash, the wise guys have been involved, nobody can account for the cash. So it was absolutely vital that we needed to link it to a charity. And the charity, which is one of the largest charities in Poland, is Caritas. It's a very well-known charity in Poland. And then we regularised that agreement with Caritas through a written legal agreement to say, we want you to set up a special page for us. As you can see, the EFU logo is on there. We want you to collect the cash just for our campaign. And when we tell you we want you to pay, this manufacturer or that manufacturer or the following manufacturer for the medicines to get the transportation through. So far so good, but the only trouble is if you're in Norway or if you're in the UK and you read that, you'll think, what the hell is this all about? Polish? I mean, there's something dodgy going on here. This is Eastern European. I wonder whether this is all as it should be. So it was clear to us that we then had to persuade all of our EFU members across Europe to link to their own individual charity in their own country. Not just because the language was their language, and not just actually because we're under different taxation systems. So if I pay £100 into medicines to Ukraine in the UK, the government of the UK give you £25 gift aid support. If I pay that £100 to a Polish charity, nobody gives any gift aid support. And the same lesson applies to all of the continental countries. So it was very important that we had local country charities to be able to do it. We needed to therefore have lots of different legal agreements with lots of different countries, with lots of different charities right across the continent, but this was all part and parcel of building up a formidable solid structure that we would never be embarrassed about. So the culture is also different. In Poland, for example, if you pay money to a charity, you do it by international bank transfer or bank transfer. Well, we pay Visa and MasterCard on, on websites here in the UK in Norway, they all pay using what they call a VIPS system, mobile phones. So the payment culture is different across the different countries. So going to all of the local countries and using local charities meant we could talk the language, we could use the culture, and we could benefit from the local taxation uh, systems. 
The charity in Poland had a really, really important job to do because if all of the other charities around the continent are connecting money, the legal agreements that we've got with them is once we're ready, we send them, we tell them to send money to Caritas, which, are, which is our main charity in Poland that receives all of the money from all of the other charities. That's its main job. It's the charity that has got a much more comprehensive memorandum of understanding, which is it pays for the medicines from the wholesalers. The reason why Caritas can do this in Poland is because it owns its own hospitals. So from a regulatory point of view, it has the legal authorities and the regulatory permissions to purchase medicines in a way that a lot of the international charities around the world aren't able to purchase medicines because they're not cleared by the regulators. So we were very, very fortunate. There was a whole series of steps that kind of fell our way that benefited us enormously. Not only that, this particular charity has got a huge amount of expertise in transferring things across that Polish-Ukrainian border because it's the country that's next to them and as you probably know, Poland's a country that's received more than two and a half million Ukrainian refugees. So that interconnectivity and all of those diplomatic channels were significantly uh, established. We managed to secure government support both from the health ministry in Ukraine and from the uh, Polish government which meant that our campaign was being protected by their transport systems, by their diplomatic channels. And frankly, before we could even start to talk to the Ukrainian government, they spent two and a half weeks checking our background, individual background checks in order, and organisational background checks on us because they told us that a lot of wise guys were in the game of trying to help Ukraine for personal benefit. And they wanted to check out what kind of individuals we were, what kind of an organisation we all were. These are all really good things that we bought into, we believe, into the campaign. Then things started to happen that we hadn't anticipated. Caritas, who was the charity that we're talking to in Poland, we said, well the plan is we're going to display these posters in pharmacy windows in Poland and we need you to set up a Just Giving page. And I was at that meeting and they kind of looked at each other and cringed and they said, you are a very important group of healthcare professionals. We went, well, yeah, I guess we are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, of course we are, yeah. Really important. And I said, we're really honoured that you as a group, as a professional group, have engaged with us, a charity, the, f the largest charity in Poland, to ask to do this. They said, would you mind much if we displayed your posters in our churches? Well, we weren't expecting that. So we've now got these posters displayed in pharmacies, we've got them displayed in churches. I was in Poland and we were driving along the road, we stopped to buy some water, and there was a church with one of our posters in the church notice board. Now, all of these posters, yes, are there for humanitarian purposes, but all of them are the opportunity for all of these uh, members of the public to talk to us about what we do as pharmacists, because that website, if you're in Poland, you go to the Polish pages. If you're in Norway, you go to the Norwegian pages. So you can read the story about pharmacy in the language of the country that the poster and the QR code is based in. And you can pay that money to your local charity. So all of these things started to happen. We really weren't expecting this, but that is another bonus of how the whole operation started to work. So the other European charities had interesting experiences as well. I went to one meeting, happens to be with CAFOD, who's our main charity partner here in the UK. And they said, do you know what? When I contacted CAFOD in the UK, I was effectively the snake oil salesman that rang their help desk. And I even said to the lady that I was talking to, I know this sounds like a bit of a snake oil salesman, but this is a campaign that we've got going. Can we work with CAFOD? It went upstairs to the directors and I got a phone call the next day and they said, you know what, we've just had a consultancy report done because we've done millions of pounds worth of funds from this Disaster Emergency Committee fundraiser. We wanted to get some medicines into Ukraine, but we've just had an independent report done that says we can't do it because it's complex, it's regulated, it's FMD, it's cold chain, it's procurement, and oh, we don't have the expertise. But you guys sound as if you know what you're talking about. Well, of course we do, we're pharmacists, we know how to do it. Do you know what they said? I don't suppose there's any chance you could take some of our funds and use it for this campaign. So these were huge benefits. We got six-figure sums from CAFOD to help us, and those kind of conversations are now starting to happen with the other charities across the continent, who've suddenly found that their partnership with pharmacy and pharmacists has given them the option to actually source, procure, indirectly, through the association with us, medicines right into where they need to get into.
So these are all benefits that we learned along the way. The first consignment that we purchased was about £200,000 worth uh, of medicines. And I have to say to you, I'm a pharmacist, but my job is to run the PDA. I generally work at a desk. I've never been in a war zone before. So that was an experience that I'll probably not forget. I, ac I actually had PTSD for about two or three weeks after I got back as a result of some of the things that I saw. We had our mobile phones and our laptops taken off us before we could cross the border because apparently there's a lot of hostile monitoring of phones going on on the other side. Um, lots of images the likes of which you're unlikely to see unless you actually go there yourself. Huge queues on the border. Two and a half days to cross the border into Ukraine. We were astonishingly lucky because we developed the diplomatic channels. We actually got through in eight and a half minutes. And that was the advantage of setting up the scheme in the way that we did with the government support and with the security support and everything else. The human cost of the war is just staggering. Now this happens to be a war in Ukraine, but it could be a, a war anywhere in the world. They were absolutely determined that I went up onto the wards. I might have worked as a hospital pharmacist for one and a half years during my career. And I've been to the wards, I've done ward pharmacy, but I've never been in a ward where Remnants of children is as I could describe them, stuck together with micropore tape and plastic tubing, without arms, without legs, is a memory that you will not forget. And these guys were absolutely desperate for basic medicines in the hospitals that they had just run out of completely in Ukraine. So these are some of the personal reflections. I wanted to buy my children some t-shirts. I wanted to buy my children some t-shirts and I went up to the lady in the market stall to buy them and the, the security guy translated that this guy they're here to buy medicines they wouldn't take the money they are so extraordinarily grateful for the help that they're getting from from the West it was really important to have gone on that visit because we learned things that we hadn't anticipated and from the West we assume a lot of things and we make terrible mistakes so we made a lot of assumptions and we changed the programme as a result of that, that visit. We learned, I mean, there was two pharmacists in that group there, myself and this is the guy from ZZPF. Who are the rest of the guys? The security team from the Ukrainian government, including anti-corruption officers. Some of these guys are ex-army. We literally needed people there because it is quite a dangerous situation you're in. There was a film crew that came with us, a translator, Two of these guys are government officials. That was the extent of the, of the journey. They were absolutely determined, the Ukrainian government, to make sure this was a success. And it really, really helped because uh, we had a film crew with us and at one point we're filming in the street and out of nowhere, out come these guys who were Ukrainian security and said, you guys don't realise that martial law has been declared. You're not allowed to film in the streets. But our Ukrainian security officials from Kiev took them over a corner, had a chat with them, they all agreed and they let us carry on filming. And that's the kind of support that you need that's the difference between a man with a van who's going to deliver stuff to his mates than a scheme that's properly organised and supported by the government, etc, etc. We visited... Oh, by the way, the reason why we got through the customs in eight and a half minutes is because the customs officials knew we were coming. They were expecting us. All of that had been pre-agreed and pre-arranged. We went to the warehouses where the medicines were. We transported them through. We found, we're talking to these clinicians in the hospital. And that was the next lesson that I learned. They were all sitting there with their arms crossed and their knees crossed like that when we first started to talk with them. And I thought, even their English was perfect, by the way, perfect English. And I thought, what's the problem? We're the good guys, but they seem to be a little bit distant from what we're trying to do here. And then I said to them, because you can see I'm taking lots of notes there, I said, have you guys got any other medicines-related issues that we might be able to help you with? They said, yeah, we've got a massive problem, antimicrobial resistance. Turns out the way they're transferring all of the casualties from the east of Ukraine, which is where all the real trouble is, to the west of Ukrainian hospitals, and they've got different antimicrobial resistant policies in the northeast and the southeast and the, and the far east, by the time it all comes to Western Europe, the whole AMR programme has broken down. And that guy in the blue jacket is the head surgeon. He says, I don't think we're going to be able to operate much past November. And I said to him, funnily enough, I'd just done some CPD on AMR just about three weeks before. I was able to talk to him about AMR. When he realised that we were healthcare professionals, 
it was a different conversation. The arms came down, the knees opened, they realised that we were one of them. And I saw that very, very powerfully uh, with my own eyes. It was extremely uh, powerful experience. The TV stations were there waiting to film us. Now, you guys won't understand Ukrainian. Some of this has got subtitles, but I want to show you this. були усі необхідні ліки. Закордонні фармацевти та благодійники об'єднались і створили ініціативу із забезпечення медикаментами. Нині вони відвідали Львівську дитячу лікарню Святого Миколая, що на вулиці Орлика. Обговорили з працівниками, чого зараз бракує найбільше у медзакладі. Згодом препарати закуплять за кордоном та передадуть на місця. That was the Ukrainian national news TV. This is the Polish national news TV. Dziś z Polski transport z lekami. Potrzeby szpitala są ogromne, dlatego dary zostały przyjęte z dużą wdzięcznością. Transport został zorganizowany w Zamościu, a pomogli darczyńcy z medykami. Pharmacists. By zrobić listę najpotrzebniejszych rzeczy i przetransportować je jak najszybciej na Ukrainę. Cała kampania leki na Ukrainę jest potrzebna i po to. And my question really to all of us in the room is, when was the last time that pharmacy and pharmacists and medicines was on prime time national television? So that was one of the things that the campaign has achieved that we weren't aiming to achieve, but it was an educational engagement exercise on a wide scale with the public, which I think has been extremely successful. We met with government officials, these guys down here, and they said to us, look, we're really grateful for your help, but don't have a laugh. And we said, well, what do you mean? I'd been in a hospital earlier, you see that picture there with boxes and boxes, there were whole rooms filled with those boxes, and that was a military hospital. I said to the senior surgeon, I said, have these soldiers got breathing difficulties or what? He said, nope. He said, these are all ventilators. I said, what do you need ventilators for? He said, yeah, we don't need them, we'll never use them, but the Americans sent them so they could greenwash their support of Ukraine by sending us the rubbish. So I said, well, Boris Johnson must have done something similar, what's he done? He said, they, the UK sent two lorry loads of paracetamol tablets with two weeks short dated supply on them. This is what the West is doing. So what the officials are saying is don't use the push system where you're just sending any old rubbish. We just need the stuff that we need. Fortunately, with the way we've set up the scheme, we're receiving orders from the Ukrainian health ministry for things that they just don't have that they desperately need. We're procuring that and that's exactly what we're sending. No more, no less. So that was an important lesson. The other important lesson they said, whatever you do, don't run a scheme where you've got a mate who works in a hospital somewhere in Ukraine and send everything there. Because all you do is you create a problem for the area where one hospital can look after their patients, the other hospitals can't look after their patients. Some of these things like blood products can expire and they'll never end up being used and they could have been used much more sensibly had the scheme been centrally coordinated. So all of our deliveries are going directly to the Ministry of Health. So, what makes it work? You need a regional network of pharmacy organisations to make this work. We need posters in all windows. The legal agreements are really important. You need a single powerful poster campaign and you need a website that can underpin and support the whole process. The, the partnerships with the various charities are absolutely crucial if we're going to protect the reputation of pharmacy. And we need to transfer all the, the funds to a central near location and we need procurement expertise there to be able to to do the job because this is a minefield to all of the organizations that we spoke to they were really really pleased that pharmacy was taking charge of this so what have we found this was launched two and a half months ago we probably raised approximately half a million pounds now of which about 165,000 I looked this morning is in the UK but actually what's starting to happen is we're finding that the donations will be coming from the organizations the governments, the charities, that's probably where all the biggest uh, funds are going to come from. And one of our colleagues actually today is in Washington talking to one of the Senate committees about medicines to Ukraine. Anything else, if you are a pharmacy organisation and members of the public and, and others who donate money can leave comments, these comments are really good for us as pharmacists, you know, get the medicines properly. I saw this in the window and realised how lucky we are. The power of cooperation, ima imagination, logistics and of course care. May you all keep safe. We are getting that message over to the public in this way. You've already seen the extensive TV coverage. 
we are doing a documentary film which by the time we finish will be able to be shown in Norway, Croatia, Poland, Germany, UK, which again will bring to the attention of the public what it is that we do as pharmacists. While I was in Ukraine, a team from the PDA office went to the Welsh Parliament to do a drop-in service. And there's a, a member of the Welsh Parliament who says, please to support the PDA launch this campaign, I've given, will you? Of the 65 members of Welsh Parliament, 34 of them turned up to that drop-in centre. A lot of them said, I didn't realise pharmacists did all of this stuff. Now that was really, really excellent engagement. There's a poster in a, in a pharmacy in a, in, a, in a window. Two weeks ago, I was at a global conference in Seville where all of the pharmacy organisations across the world came. And why was I there? Because I wanted them, yeah, to support what we're doing with Ukraine. But more importantly, through FIP, we would like to see this scheme launched across the six regions of the world so it can respond to crises, whether they're in Africa, South America, wherever these crises are. We believe we've got the infrastructure, the systems and the processes, the website that can carry that kind of a programme. Since FIP, here are all the countries that have now joined the Medicines to Ukraine scheme. We're now designing posters for them in Spanish. We're sending them out posters. We're putting extra pages on the website. It turns out that this Ukrainian campaign is extremely popular all around the world, but ultimately it could be anything or any, anywhere where pharmacists need to show leadership in the area of medicines in terms of a crisis. So, final slide. It's all about humanitarian issues, but it's about the educational exercise. Now we engage with members of the public, creating a win-win for members of the public and, and humanitarian issues, as well as for our profession the pharmacy. So thank you very much for, for coming along to finding out more about this. I'd be really delighted if you could do your best to get these posters in pharmacy windows in the UK because I have to say, and I've travelled to Europe a lot, at this moment in time UK is the place where we have the fewest posters up in windows. In some countries they've got them in 60 or 70 percent of the pharmacies. We reckon 5 percent, maybe 10 percent here in the UK. So anything that you guys could do to use your contacts and your good offices to get them out, we'd be really, really grateful. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, we've possibly got time to take one or two questions if anybody's got any at all. Um, thank you. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, I'm a member of the PDA, so I'm so proud of um, this, this thing. And it just looks like perfection, really. And I really just want to say thank you for all the work you've done. I'm sure you've got many thanks about that. Right, my question was almost answered in the last slide because it's such a good um, campaign or effort that I would love to see it worldwide. So what I wanted to know is what was the feedback you got from FIP in terms of what countries can benefit from a campaign like this? And more importantly, because we all know how long the war in Ukraine might be. Yeah. It might be quite a long time. Have you identified any regions in the world where you think you could replicate this, um, who, who have similar kind of conditions as we speak? Thank so you. the answer is yes. We, we, we only came back from FIP about two and a half weeks ago. FIP are absolutely delighted with this. And more importantly, we want to give this to FIP. This isn't going to be a, a global PDA initiative. This is going to be a FIP initiative. We're giving them all of our materials. We're giving them our websites, legal documents. More importantly, we've now joined FIP. And the challenge they've given us is they want us to drive this through. So we're meeting with the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. One of our people was uh, Senate committee today. I expect that to be accelerated through over the next six months. I mean, it is an extra job that came out of nowhere. So it'll take time, but more importantly, it's best to do the job right rather than to rush. So I can't give you an answer on the time frame, but what I do know, with all the conversations that we had in FIP, people were really delighted that they could see pharmacy and a structure to enable pharmacy to take a lead across all of these different countries. But to answer your question about which, which areas, we all saw the floods in Pakistan. We were watching the news. Floods in Pakistan, what was the second thing that they said? We all heard it, waterborne diseases. Now, the formula for Ukraine was they ran out of medicines to treat people with blast injuries because in Ukraine they only have about 5% of medicines that can treat people with blast injuries. If 70% of the casualties are now blast injuries, they're going to run out. 
Same in Pakistan. Waterborne diseases means they need medicines to treat waterborne diseases. It'll be the same principles will apply anywhere where we go. So we're having meetings with the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association to give them the materials and the, um, all of the things that they need to roll it out there. And I suspect that these things will be governed locally and globally. There'll be some crises that will lend themselves to a regional response. There'll be others that will lend themselves to a more global response. And we can't determine that, neither we can control that. But I do see there being a hybrid benefit that we've got parts of the UK, for example, where if there was a campaign in Pakistan for the floods, the pharmacies would be delighted to put posters up in their windows to support the campaign that that region is running but that they can connect to because we've created it as part of the pharmacy family. And that's part of the objective of why we wanted to work with FIPA and the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. Question at the back. Hi, Cos. Um, Joe Golding, NHS Digital. Um, can you leverage any of the work that's been done by WHO on the supply chain around vaccine rollout? So they did a lot of work, especially with companies like GS1, in terms of supply chain management. Can you work on, with WHO on that? So here's the thing. In the way that I got deeper and deeper and deeper in this because we had meetings and we met with more people, through our links with FIP, it turns out that they are the formal conduit to WHO for pharmacy globally. That's the bit that they are going to be delivering. So they are already starting to talk to WHO about this, but it's early days. We only went to FIP Congress about three weeks ago. So the answer is it will absolutely involve the World Health Organization. It has to, because we don't just want to be engaging members of the public. We want, when something happens, for all of the organizations locally to say, medicines, that's the pharmacists that do that. Let's give them 10 million or whatever it is to get that one sorted out. That's really where we want to get to. So WHO is a vital part of that. We want to be working in collaboration with everybody. Last question, I think, here. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your doing fantastic job. Uh, as the gentleman has said it, I had no intention of asking the question, but uh, as you mentioned about Pakistan, uh, the waterborne diseases and all that, myself, I'm in distribution. I'm the responsible person for the uh, uh, wholesaler. So I understand what you were saying about the uh, cold chain and, and, and the FMD and all that. Yeah. I understand. And the challenges of those countries which are less developed are going to be more. So in terms of uh, how can we engage there or what type of support you need from individuals like uh, myself, again, who's fluent in that language, who understand that culture, how could we uh, do that? Thank I you. see two ways. I see two ways. First of all, all that l language and has to be done locally by the regional organisation that's going to be doing this. So in the same way that FU did Europe, I would imagine that the sub-Asian continent of equivalent of FU will be doing the stuff on the ground because of the language and the culture. However, the requests for help that we get from the government can be satiated in two ways. A, funds give us money so we can buy, B, organisations like yours who say, what do they need because we can probably send it, but you need to know exactly what it is that they need rather than just send two lorry loads of stuff that they won't want. So I would imagine whoever it is that's working regionally, and in FU we've started to develop it this way, we are now talking to manufacturers and wholesalers, so when we get our list that they want us to procure, rather than just figuring out, have we got half a million quid to pay for this, we are now start starting to talk to manufacturers who say, if you've got these items on your list, let us know, because we can donate them. And in that way, it comes as part of an organised structure, rather than just sending stuff off in the dark in the lorry. And that's the way I think it will, it will probably work. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for all coming along. I hope you found that of, uh, of use.